Welcome to meeting number 98 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Indigenous and Northern Affairs. We recognize that we meet on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, we are going to jump right into our uh, opening statements, and I do apologize for the delay, but votes take priority over what we're doing here. Um, today we have, uh, from the Office of the Auditor General, uh, the Office of the Correctional Investigator of Canada, Dr. Ivan Zinger, Correctional Investigator of Canada, and um, Dr. Zinger is joined by Hazel Myron, Deputy Director, Indigenous Portfolio. So welcome to you both. Um, colleagues, I have out been asked, normally we have a five-minute opening statement. Uh, Dr. Zinger would like to have 10 minutes to go through the report, um, and then we'll get into the first round of questions. Um, is there agreement that we allow the 10 minutes? So with that, Dr. Zeng, we'll turn it over to you, and um, I'll start my uh, clock. I'll let you know. I'll, I'll give you a red um, card or a yellow card when there's 30 seconds left, and a red card when the time's up, and just wrap it up, and we'll get into our discussion at that point. Uh, merci infiniment. Um, je voudrais. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking the chair and the members of this committee for um, welcoming us. And I am going to talk to you about our latest annual report, which includes a systemic report on incarcerated Indigenous individuals in Canada. Uh, she's my uh, deputy director for Indigenous Portfolio, and she has a lot of experience and has been uh, one of four key members of my investigative team uh, that produce uh, this document, which uh, is our largest systemic investigation we've conducted uh, by my office uh, and this is the the context of of my appearance i would like to simply uh, start by providing a bit of an historical context and a chronology that i think will um, uh, resonate uh, hopefully with you my office was uh, first established back in 1973 so we're just a little over 50 years old uh, it was established pursuant to the Inquiries Act. And interestingly, the very first annual report of my um, office, uh, the correctional investigator at the time, Inger Hansen, uh, highlighted some issues around uh, poor treatment of Indigenous incarcerated uh, persons. Um, between 1973 and now, my office has issued more than 80 recommendations dealing specifically with Indigenous corrections. And unfortunately, uh, only a handful have been followed up by Correctional Service of Canada. In 1992, uh, the role of my office was uh, um, entrenched in legislation, and the Moroni government uh, enacted the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. That is, uh, uh, was a wonderful uh, piece of legislation, very progressive, uh, which speaks to uh, charter rights and administrative law principles. And it included two very uh, progressive uh, provisions, section 81 and 84. And those sections enabled the Minister of Public Safety, at that time it was Solicitor General, to enter into agreement with indigenous communities for the care, custody, or supervision of indigenous um, <coughs> persons, uh, incarcerated persons. As you well know, in 1999, which is now 25 years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada released its uh, um, historical judgment on uh, the Queen versus Gladue. And it stated at that time that by 1997, Aboriginal people constituted closer to 3% of the population of Canada and amounted to 12% of all federal inmates. It further stated that the figures are stark and reflect what may fairly be termed a crisis in the Canadian criminal justice system. So remember that number, 12%. <clears throat> In 2001, Prime Minister Jean Chrétien stated in a speech from the throne, and I quote, Canada must take the measures needed to significantly reduce the percentage of Aboriginal people entering the criminal justice system so that within a generation, it is no longer higher than the Canadian average. Of course, that time frame has long passed. In 2013, my office issued a special report on Indigenous corrections. 
it found that Correctional Services of Canada moved away from implementing Section 81 in the early 2000s, favor, favoring instead investment inside penitentiary with its Pathways Initiative. Four healing lodges remained operated by corrections to this day instead of having been transferred to Indigenous communities as originally planned. My office reported a significant funding disparity between um, CSC-operated healing lodges and Section 81 healing lodges, basically 62 cents on the dollar. In 2015, uh, the call for action of the Truth and Reconciliation recommended that the government commit to eliminate the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade. So we are one year away from that deadline. It's not going to happen. In fact, in 2015, the percentage of Indigenous persons in federal custody was 25%. It now stands at, and I'm afraid I've made a mistake in my opening remarks, it's not 32, but as of today, it is 33%. Um, and this is a new, shameful, historical milestone. One-third are Indigenous in our penitentiaries. And for Indigenous federally sentenced women, the situation um, is even more critical it moved from 37% in 2015 to 50% today. <clears throat> in 2019, the call uh, to justice of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls made 17 recommendations related to federal corrections, including increasing the use of Section 81 and 84. It also made some comments with respect to enhancing the role of elders and uh, implementing consistent application of GLADU factors in decision making. Let me skip now to 2021, when the Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau issued new mandate letters, which included addressing the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system. Over the last 20 years, Correctional Service has developed five distinct strategies on, on Indigenous corrections. Unfortunately, and despite significant efforts and resources, my office has not observed any significant or measurable improvements on key correctional outcomes, which, by the way, Corrections has control over. So compared to, uh, like if you compare Indigenous uh, versus non-Indigenous prisoners, the Indigenous are overrepresented in maximum security institution. They're overrepresented in structured intervention units, which is the old regime of administrative segregation. They're more likely to be um, involved in use of force. They're more likely to self-injure. They're more likely to attempt suicide. They served a higher proportion of their sentence and are typically released at uh, the great majority at statutory release, which is at two-thirds uh, of their sentence. They have a higher rate of parole suspension and revocation and also a higher rate of recidivism. In 10 years after our initial uh, Spirit Matters report, we, did, we completed an, an update. And part one and two are, have been uh, combined into this book. We've made, we conducted more than 223 interviews, uh, including 55 elders. In 10 years, overrepresentation in federal custody went from 23% to 33% overall, and from 32 to 50% for indigenous incarcerated women. Uh, <clears throat> The updated that we concluded uh, reviewed three key signature initiatives, and I would like to uh, highlight some of the findings on those three initiatives. The first one are healing lodges. There are currently 10 healing lodges uh, in federal corrections. Four are operated by corrections and have a capacity of 250 beds, which is about 4% of the indigenous uh, in-custody population. 
and six of those healing lodges are operated under Section 81, therefore community-based, but only have 139 beds, which uh, can, has a capacity to house only about 2% of the Indigenous uh, in-custody population. There are no healing lodges in Ontario, in the Atlantic provinces, or in the north. And it's still, in terms of funding, 62 cents on the dollar. Corrections mentioned to us back 10 years ago that it had actually increased funding to those community healing lodges run by indigenous communities. But it also increased funding to its own uh, healing lodges so that the difference has actually remained the same, the disparity. The second initiative that we looked at are pathways units. And there are currently 350 pathways bed, which represent about 8% of the total indigenous prison population, if there are no vacancy, because unfortunately there are vacancies. These pathways are supposed to provide enhanced access to indigenous uh, services uh, and ceremonies, in including access to culture, ceremony, and traditional healing. Unfortunately, because there are now over 4,500 uh, Indigenous people, over 90% of those Indigenous prisoners uh, are denied access to what, in my view, are constitutional rights, which is that, and, and should not be considered privilege or uh, program. Um, it is uh, very unfortunate to have uh, restricted access to those uh, enhanced services. And finally, we looked at um, the delivery of elder services. And our interviews overwhelmingly found that those elders felt under-supported, undervalued, and underappreciated by Correctional Service of Canada. They do not get sick leave, paid vacation, health benefits, or job security. And most felt overworked and lacking in influence and respect. So when my annual report was tabled on November 1st, uh, 2023, I uh, hosted a press conference between, before the National Press Theater. And I was joined uh, and very proud to be joined by the ITK president, by the Métis National Council president, and by the AFN regional chief for Quebec and Labrador. And those three national leaders made it quite clear that they agreed that CSC policies and operations are not working and unresponsive to Indigenous people. They further agreed that Correctional Service Canada must divest significant control, authority, and resources to Indigenous communities and organizations for the care, custody, and supervision of Indigenous people. So thank you. I will leave it to that. And I'm happy to respond to your questions. Thank you so much for uh, the, um, that context that you've given us. Uh, um, I think it's um, some uh, very important uh, numbers to look at and, and uh, facts to consider. Uh, so I look forward to our round of questions that we're going to have. Um, just for everybody's information, uh, Dr. Zinger did bring a copy of the book. He has English and French versions, uh, 10 Years Since Sp Spirit Matters. And so for, I'll grab a copy for everybody. Sebastian, I'll grab a uh, French one for you if, uh, if that's okay. And, um, and have it available for you. And uh, we'll get one for Michael and um, the, uh, the regular members, Bob and um, uh, Marcus. And then if any of the uh, members filling in today also would like to get one, if there's some extras, we'll uh, get you those copies as well. But uh, first up for six minutes, I'll turn to Mr. Schmale and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to our witness for the uh, testimony today. Um, I wonder if uh, you could tell us uh, based on the numbers you just just gave us in the statistics, um, why the uh, there has been no real improvement.